I, I would like to thank Indian Heritage Center, especially Dr. Gauri, Amanda, and Nalina for tracing me and inviting me to this prestigious seminar as the only person from India. To thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, now, so far you were dealing in history, and now, and uh, talking about Singapore and Malaysia, now I take you to Thailand. See, in this paper, an attempt has been made to draw the contours of sandwich culture of Punjabis and Gorakhpuris who migrated to Thailand towards the end of 19th century. I selected Bengali, this Punjabis and Gorakhpuris, though they were in the maximum number in Thailand. Right? Though there were other communities, but these were the two more dominating communities, and that is why I selected these two. They, using the sandwich culture syndrome, an attempt has been made in this paper to answer the following issues. What, how the Indians with different socio-economic and cultural background in Thailand have adapted and adjusted themselves? Secondly, what role has been played by cultural, contextual, and situational conditions in adaptation and adjustment of Indians in Thailand. The cultural factors refer to the conditions in the present, in the parent society from where immigrants migrated and to the circumstances under which migration took place. Demographic characteristics and motivation of migration and their attitude towards members of the host society. The contextual conditions are those which immigrants face in the host society, such as socioeconomic and political conditions in the host society, attitude towards migrants, and culture of the host society. The experiences of individuals and groups in the host society have been referred as situational conditions. Whether these people have integrated and assimilated in the host society, or are they sandwiched between the two cultures? Before I discuss about the sandwich culture, let me give you a very brief account of the history of migration of Indians in Thailand. As I, am, as I am not comfortable with our presentation, I am not uh, dealing with, I am not discussing that, I am presenting it. Please put the lights on also. <laughs> it was in the second and third century BC that the traders and merchants from India developed contacts with the people of Southeast Asia who were mainly attracted by fabulous quantities of gold and other precious mineral besides spices. These traders and merchants came from all parts of India and belonged to different castes among Hindus and other religious groups. It is believed that the knowledge and experience gained by these people, these early migrants, not only induced the other traders, but also encouraged other people from different walks of life to migrate to Southeast Asia and settle. However, it was the during Mauryan period, especially during the reign of Ashoka, that the Indian culture and religion left its imprint in the region. The rulers of South India, especially the Pallavas and Chola Empire of Tamils also contributed to the Indianization of the process of Southeast Asia. The trade relations between India and Southeast Asia got boost from the first century AD, when some Indian migrants founded their own kingdom by marrying the daughters of local chieftains and la lasted at the emergence of Thais as the major power after 1300 years. Indians who migrated during this period became a part of the locals by marrying their women folks, and in the process, they lost their identity as Indian. The second wave of Indian migration began sometime in 19th century 
when the British were granted permission to trade at Singapore's airport port in 1826. Indians, being the British subject, also started migrating to Thailand. With the abolition of slavery in Thailand in 1905 and the shortage of labor, the demand for Indians and Chinese who were ready to work as hired laborers in rubber and teak plantations enhanced. Since the locals preferred to work in the rice cultivation, this did not create any conflict with the locals. Another group of Indians who migrated to Thailand were Tamils, both Hindus and Muslims. Tamil Muslims started migrating as butchers, whereas educated Muslims were employed by British firms. Another group of Muslims, especially Boras, migrated from Surat and Bombay and started textile business. Number of Bora families was around 15, where number of Tamil families was around 50. Then Punjabis, both Hindus and Sikhs and Gorakhpuris, migrated, started migrating to Thailand around late 19th century. In the beginning, their number was not very large. Punjabis mainly came from three districts of Western Punjab, which is now a part of Pakistan, namely Gujrawala, Sekhopura, and Sialkot. Most of the Punjabi migrants were related to each other, and uh, the, some of the you see, uh, second things that among Punjabis, it was a chain migration. Chain migration that first one member of the family came, it was followed by brothers and other relations. It was chain migration among them. <coughs> the Gorakhpuris, Punjabis were mainly engaged in textile business. Some of the Gorakhpuris who took part in the War of Indian Independence in 1857 came to Thailand via Burma. Since being a part of India at that time, Burma was not a safe place. Therefore, these people migrated to Thailand. All of them were dairymen. Quite a large number of Punjabis and Gorakhpuris migrated during the Second World War. In addition, there were few army personnel who were fighting for British in Malaysia and Singapore and were disgusted by the discriminatory behavior of British officers in matters of promotion and other facilities deserted the British Army. Among Gorakhpuris, it was a relay migration. Relay migration means that first one member of the family will come then he will go back and he will be followed by the other member of the family. So Punjabis was a chain migration. Punjabis migrated to Thailand to settle down permanently, whereas Gorakhpuri's main intention was not to settle down permanently, but to make money and go back. Since Punjabis wanted to settle there, they brought their families. Some of them got married in Thailand whereas few went back to India to get married. Even some asylum relations from Punjabis also migrated. In the beginning, all of them settled in one area, which is called Forat, Forat Market, which is also known as Mini India. And most of them, they were settled in that area. And if you go to the Forat Market, it looks like an Indian market. All the shops, the Indian music will be there, Gurukhpuri shops are there, all sorts of shops are there. And, and earlier, all of them were settled there, but after they started their business, most of the prosperous Punjabis, they started moving out from Farat area and they went to the more posh colonies. But Gurukhpuris, most of them, they still decide in different area. The residential pattern of both the groups are totally different. Now, you see, the second thing that when the migrants go to other country, when they mix with the people of the host society, please put that table, there are nine possibilities which I have prepared in this form. This is the table which I have prepared. Then when the migrants, they are willing to assimilate society and the host society culture is also accepting them or not. In the first condition, migrants assimilate in the host society, forgiving their original identity as happened when Europeans migrated to the USA. The host, the host society became a melting pot 
with a new American culture took birth. Another extreme was when both the migrants, cell number nine, when both the migrants as well as migrants and natives are not willing to even intermingle, as happened when indentured labor from India settled in Trinidad. <coughs> and this group has been called by Furnival as plural society. All other examples of the mixture of the sandwich culture. Besides, there are some other concepts which are not. Migrants in the remaining cells have to adopt some aspects of culture of the host society in order to settle permanently without assimilating and integrating into the host society. In these conditions, migrants became a part of two cultures, their own parent culture and the culture of the host society. In the process of acculturation, immigrants learn the language and some other cultural trait which might be necessary for their stay without discarding their own values and beliefs. Coughlin has called this as a phenomenon of double identity. The people may have, the, while he coined this term while studying the Chinese in Thailand, the people may have a double identity, but the culture is the, called the sandwich culture. And this term by sandwich culture has given by my teacher Yogesh Atal. Let me now come into the, what is sandwich culture. The concept of sandwich culture has been proposed by Yogesh Atal in an article, Outsiders as Insiders, the phenomenon of sandwich culture, published in a journal of sociology, Sociological Bulletin, in 18, 1989. Migration of people, writes Settle, exposes the host society to new ma men, material, and messages, which are screened by a society's gatekeepers, which permit or deny their entry. A society with powerful insulatory mechanisms may thwart all entries and maintain its pristinity. A complete breakdown of the insulators would result in the society's absorption into another bigger powerful system. This dynamic of interplay of society's insulators and apertures determines its degree of integration. The term sandwich refers to the process of laying of placing something between two layers. A sandwich man will carry two tags, one representing the country of origin and other the country of his migration. The dual concepts of insulators and apertures have been adopted by Atal to discuss the sandwich culture of a background group. Insulators and aperture model, in fact, operates equally for migrants as well as for the host society in order to test and empirically verify the concept of sandwich culture, two sets of factors which operate to facilitate or hinder the process of formation of sandwich culture are insulatory mechanisms and aperture openings. The aperture openings include intermarriages, adoption of names of the host society, use of language of the host society, religious conversion, promotion of intercommensability, adoption of food habits, and developing a taste for the host place. Insulatory mechanisms include retention of mother tongue, concentration of living quarters to promote greater interaction with the members of the group, provision of separate education facilities for children, practice of endogamy, concentration in certain occupations, formation of voluntary organizations, pursuit of parental religion, continuation of food habits and taboos associated with eating, retention of cultural diacritical particulars in the matter of dress, keeping aperture open to the parent culture in the form of frequent visits, schooling of children in parent society, a final relations back home, exposure to media such as music and film, and regular communication with the members back home through telephone, email, etc. Now, not going into the other, to be, to be sandwiched between the parent culture and the culture of the host society. It is necessary that the migrants must open apertures to the host society, and at the same time must retain few traits of the parent culture. Now, I'm coming to the fine, major findings. I'm not discussing the last bit. Oh, sorry. 
See, a comparative picture of both the groups reveals that aperture mechanisms are more actively operating among Punjabis as compared to Gorakhpuris. The more aperture opening by Punjabis does not indicate that they are more susceptible to assimilate in high society. However, it shows that their level of sandwich culture is definitely higher as compared to Gorakhpuris. Punjabis and Gorakhpuris in Thailand not at the same level of acculturation, despite the fact that they started migrating to Thailand almost at the same time towards the end of 19th century. The differences in approach in adaptation of their groups might have been affected by their cultural, contextual, and situational conditions. The cultural conditions of Punjabis, both Hindus and Sikhs, are same as they hail from the same region called Punjab situated in the northern part of India, and their level of acculturation is more or less the same. The distinctive feature of Punjabi culture is its adaptability and openness to change. This must be due to the fact that most of the invaders to India with different cultures came from northwest, and Punjab being geographically closest to the border had the maximum impact. Thus, Punjab became a melting pot of various complex and composite culture. Immigrants with this kind of cultural background are more prone to adapt and adjust in a new environment. Since Punjabis, both Hindus and Sikhs migrated to Thailand with their families, we showed their inclination to settle permanently in Thailand. This inclination, one of the significant indicators of their approach was when they accepted Thai girls as daughters-in-law. Though the number of cases might not be many, but it certainly has made dent in opening up cultures. As compared to Punjabis, Gurukhpuris are more traditional and rigid, and the attitude is also different. They hail from the eastern part of India, which is not exposed to outside world as compared to people from North India. Their approach and attitude towards Thai culture and people is different from that of Punjabis. Besides learning Thai language, which is necessary for their survival, they are not open to accept other aspects of Thai culture. Moreover, majority of them came to Thailand not to settle permanently, but to make fortune, or at least be out a living. This has also played a crucial role in their approach towards Thais. Large number of Gorakhpuris have not brought their families to Thailand. Most of them migrated alone and never brought their families. Old members were replaced by new members, thus making relay migration more frequent among Gaurav police. Okay. Despite the fact that Punjabis are more open to Thai culture as compared to Gaurav police, all of them take various measures to keep parent culture alive. Formation of various associations educational institutions and religious centers creates hurdles in opening up cultures. By organizing various social, cultural, and religious functions, opportunities are provided to migrants to keep the parent culture alive and at the same time expose the younger ones to parent <coughs> culture. These functions enable the migrants for social interaction, enhance the feeling of social and cultural cohesiveness and also provide psychological support to new migrants. However, the conscious and deliberate attempts by Gorakhpuris to insulate themselves from Thai culture and society make them less vulnerable for assimilation. This also brings down their level of sandwich culture. The level of sandwich culture of uh, Gorak Punjabis have placed the level of in this nine point scale at the level of five. So the Gorakhpuris are come at the level of seven or eight. They don't go beyond that. Now let me conclude. In concluding remarks, I may say that there are very few cases of Indians, especially Hindus, and those who belong to those religions which are offshoots of Hinduism, such as Jainism and Sikhism, who have really assimilated in the host society. One of the factors which affects the assimilation of migrants in the host society is their basic personality structure. According to Cardinal, certain, certain culturally established techniques of child treatment 
had the effect of shaping basic attitudes, and that these attitudes enjoyed a permanent existence in that mental equipment of an individual. The seeds of basic personality structure are sown in the early stages of socialization process. The values learned in the family becomes a part of the basic personality structure of an individual, and these values are nurtured and nourished by various ethnic, religious, and linguistic groups in an alien society. Children born and brought up in foreign countries develop these values directly or vicariously and retain their cultural identity, which inhibits them to assimilate in the host society. As a consequence, majority of the migrants are sandwiched between the parent culture and the culture of the host society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, first of all, to Mahmoud Abdul Ghani Kashmir for putting this whole thing together, and thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of it. My name is Benita, and I'm going to speak to you today about mapping the religious landscape of the Indian community. My work uh, so far has been on, on, on Hinduism, so you know I'm always associated with the study of Hinduism in Singapore. But uh, today, I'm going to talk about the Indian community and the religious uh, landscape of the Indian community. Uh, I should also say that the sort of theoretical uh, direction of this uh, talk is um, shaped by part of a bigger project that I have done, which really looks at religion, state encounters in the straight settlement, right? So, I mean, this sounds like a descriptive topic, but I mean, there are two fundamental questions I'm asking. One is, what happens to religion under different political arrangements, uh, you know, colonial state and post-colonial state, and also the whole question of how is religion, uh, religious diversity managed by states, right? So, whether it's colonial state or post-colonial state. And I'm really interested in trying to identify structures of governance within religious communities and whether these structures of governance, uh, particularly the, the whole idea of self-governance, is permissible under particular kinds of, of uh, state arrangements, right? So, so that's my sort of real interest uh, in talking about this. So let me begin with the story in the beginning. Uh, okay, so beginning with the present, it's very obvious that if you look at the Indian community in Singapore today, the the, uh, the whole idea of diversity and differentiation and pluralism mark the scene. I mean, this is obvious to anybody, right? So religious pluralism is constituted by, and if you can demonstrate this religious pluralism within the community by looking at a number of different things like places of worship, uh, religious uh, organizations, religious institutions, and especially ethno-linguistic community, uh, religious and cultural groups, as well as uh, public festivals and, and ceremonies which, which mark the Singapore landscape. So it, it's no surprise that you know, pluralism is the order of the day, right? Next, please. But I wanted to actually begin by talking about some shifts in demography that are within the Indian community, which, which we know about, but which are worth just pointing out. Uh, so if you look at the, uh, the Indian community uh, between 1990 and 2012, you will see a, a dramatic increase in percentage terms, right? Uh, from 7.1, I don't know if you can see that, it's from 7.1 to 9.2 in 2012. And this is a significant shift. Uh, and I think the impact of this on, on the sort of reconfiguration of the Singaporean Indian community has yet to be studied. I mean, you know, in terms of how uh, this sort of in uh, this group of new uh, migrants, as they are called in the Indian community in, in many different ways, uh, whether it's uh, in, in class terms, in caste terms, and certainly how the whole religious landscape has also been, been shaken in some very interesting ways. Next, please. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, given the sort of shifts in the Indian community uh, numerically, we also see uh, that this has been registered in shifting religious demography of, the, of, of, of Singapore as a whole, uh, where for the first time since 1970, the uh, proportion of Hindus in Singapore has moved from, from 4% uh, to 5.1 percent. I mean, these these are quite you know percent. I mean, percentage changes take a long time to register. For this to be registered over a 10-year period is quite a significant shift. So I wanted to highlight that. Next, please. 
And then if you look at the sort of religious diversity within the Indian community itself, and these are census categories, uh, which I'm using just to map the scene. Uh, so uh, Hindus constitute the majority. It's a slight majority of in 2000 of 55.4, followed by Islam, 25%, uh, Christianity, 12, and other religions. Uh, other religions uh, in the census in, within the Indian category includes uh, Sikhs, Jains, uh, Jews, and Parsis, and, and a small uh, proportion of Buddhists, Indian Buddhists as well, right? And then if we move to the next uh, slide, please. Uh, in 2020, you see that the percentage of, of Hindus has risen significantly to almost 60%, uh, uh, and then uh, the proportion of Islam has actually gone down from 25 to almost to 21%. So these are just some figures to give us sort of, uh, you know, to, to map the field uh, in, in broad terms. Okay, uh, moving on from the uh, uh, sort of uh, beginning, uh, moving from the present, right? I think a turn to history is very important. And, uh, you know, uh, Cheeky and earlier had talked about uh, Little India and, you know, argued that the term itself is problematic. And, and, you know, of course, we know that the term itself is of recent origin. It, it sort of came about in the 80s. You know, people didn't talk about Little India prior to that. Um, but I think a turn to history is very important, especially, and also a, a turn to history to look beyond Singapore, not just to confine our analysis to Singapore itself, but to remember that Singapore was very much a part of other uh, geographical and political entities before it became what it is today. So my interest is in looking at the straight settlements of which Singapore was a part together with, with uh, Penang and Malacca. And so I'd like to actually uh, take you through the uh, religious scene in the straight settlements from about the middle of the 19th century or slightly before that. So uh, if you look at the uh, straight settlement in the 19th century, we see a whole range of ethnic communities from varied regions speaking a number of different languages and belonging to different religious traditions in the straight settlements. And the incidence of non-Christian religious activity in this, in this region can be traced to the earliest decades of the 19th century. Right? Uh, places of worship were established by Chinese and Indian migrants to Singapore and Penang in the, 19, uh, in the 1830s, and they're very prominent examples of this, like the, the Sri Mariman Temple uh, in Singapore is dated to 1822, and the Tian Kang Temple in Singapore is founded uh, in 1839, although the Mariman Temple was properly set up in 1827. So we can say that the 19th century uh, straight settlements witnessed the growth of, of lots of religious institutions and uh, the streets were full of religious processions and uh, you know we see public observances of religious festivals as well next please next please Okay, so uh, if, so so that's that's the scene in the so so actually you know the point I'm trying to make is that the religious diversity that we see in Singapore today, whether uh, overall or within particular communities, it's not new, it's not recent, it's actually quite it has deep historical roots, right? So if we look at the Indian presence in Singapore, of course we know that it was a free port. Uh, there were new, no duties and taxes uh, levied on trade practices, and the settlement uh, of, of Singapore was very attractive, and it drew scores of of immigrants in the early years, more so than in Malacca and Penang. And there's been a lot of, uh, you know, very, very interesting presentations on uh, indentured labor and convict past of the Indian community. But I think it's also important to remember that there were other kinds of migrations into Singapore as well, right? So, of course, you know, we talk about involuntary migration when we talk about indentured and, and uh, convict labor, but there were a significant uh, levels of voluntary migrants as well who came in for precisely these kinds of opportunities uh, because Singapore was seen as a, as a place where the streets were lined with gold and you could come in and, and make a good life for yourself. And so there were lots of migrants from, from India itself who came in search of trade opportunities, work opportunities to work in the civil services later on when, when the colonial government got its act together. So uh, it's important to balance the sort of uh, the profile of the migrants to include voluntary migrants as well. Um, in 1849, Singapore, uh, here's a, a quotation taken from the census of, Sing a census of Singapore and its dependencies. Uh, and if you look at the the, uh, the population in 1849, it was 52,891. And if you look at the, the, the categories that are used to describe the kind of people who were present here, these categories were actually quite detailed and uh, you know, 
refer, of course, they're all very mixed up, so they're not sort of, uh, you know, marked out according to ethnicity, uh, religion, etc. So they're all mixed up. So we have Europeans, Eurasians, Armenians, Arabs, Balinese, Boyanese, Bugis, etc., Jews, uh, Parsi, and Siamese. Um, I think the, the, and their religious backgrounds are as Christians, Jews, Parsis, Mohammedans, Hindu, and Buddhist. Uh, one of the things that we notice in the sort of profiling of the diversity of Singapore uh, population ethno-linguistically and religiously is that um, prior to independence, um, the categories that were used to denote uh, people of different backgrounds were actually much more detailed and much more specific, and they weren't sort of uh, big categories, homogenous categories that er uh, erase differences. Whereas, you know, starting from the from the uh, certainly from the 70s onwards, uh, we have the emergence of what everybody knows as the CMIO categories, right? Which are really these large, chunky. Uh, totalizing categories like the Chinese, Malays, and Indians, which tend to erase and eradicate precisely these kinds of differences that were recognized in many earlier censuses that were taken. But, but, but we do get a sense from this that already by the middle of the 19th century, there was a great deal of, of diversity, ethno-linguistic, uh, regional, national, as well as certainly religious diversity within uh, not just the Indian community, but the Singapore uh, population as a whole. Next, please. Now, the Indian community, of course, arrived in Singapore much later in comparison to Penang and Malacca, but it is interesting that, uh, that, that by 1860, it had become the second largest community in Singapore after the Chinese, and in fact, had displaced the Malay community, which had become you know, quite reduced in numbers. So uh, by 1860, the Chinese community was the dominant one, and then th there was a significant uh, number of, uh, size of the Indian community. It was the second largest community. Um, it has been noted by, by scholarship on the subject in terms of uh, British, uh, in terms of religious affiliation, the majority of the Indians who migrated to uh, British Malaya uh, came from a Hindu background, and uh, Sandhu uh, in particular has suggested that this percentage was around 75 to 80 percent, and uh, the rest were constituted by Sikhs, Muslims, and, and, and Christians. And it has also been noted that if you look at the, the migrating uh, communities into, into Singapore, uh, Indians constituted religiously the most diverse community, right? So you had a whole range of uh, affiliations present from Hindus to Muslims to Christians to Sikhs, Parsis, Buddhists, and, and, and Jains, and Zoroastrians, as well as uh, proponents of what are known as modern uh, Indian uh, social reform movements. So, you know, adherents, uh, you know, followers of, uh, of, uh, of course, Sai Baba, etc., came much later, but earlier we had the Arya Samaj and the Ramakrishna Mission in the early decades of the, of the 20th century. They already had a firm presence in, in Singapore. Uh, so the, the, the point to, to note, I think, and, and this is the lesson of, of turning to history is that the sort of ethnic and religious pluralism we see uh, today within the community, which actually continues to be diversified even more as the community uh, receives new migrants and you know uh, changes, uh, but this is not a new condition. This this has this pluralism has deep historical uh, roots uh, from its days as a as a as a British colony. Next, please. Um, now, I, don't, I won't want to talk too much about this because several of my colleagues on this panel have already talked uh, with much uh, greater expertise about marking of spaces uh, through race and religion, and this is something that we see, of course, for Singapore, and uh, parts of the island were marked as Indian, Muslim, or Hindu, and these were not accidents, uh, but reflect early patterns of, of settlement determined by the sort of larger political economic logic of the uh, British colonial government. Um, now, of course, the designation of what is known today as Little India as an Indian space is traced to, uh, uh, to the colonial context, but it's interesting that uh, this uh, space, which is called Little India, and I put it in quotations here, it was just one of the areas on the island that was, uh, you know, marked by Indian presence. So you had other areas like um, Keppel Road area, Tanjung Pagar, Yishun, Sambawang. I mean, all of these areas also had very significant uh, Indian presence. And uh, given that these were sort of, uh, uh, you know, inhabited by Indian communities, you also found the, the rise of various uh, religious institutions, including, for example, Hindu temples uh, in, in, the, in the Little India district, and then uh, also very significant uh, early 19th century Muslim um, uh, sorry, mosques, mosques, Indian Muslim mosques within uh, Little India as well. 
Um, now, the, the point to note, and, and Chikian again noted this, that this is a very plural space in the present, but again, this is not a new condition. So if you go back to the early decades of the, uh, well, mid to the mid uh, 19th century, you already see that it's a multi-ethnic and multi-religious space. So it was initially a Indian Hindu Muslim space, but then you had uh, a, a great deal of uh, uh, presence from well, there was a Gurdwara, there, was, there were Buddhist temples along Racecourse Road, and there were churches, both for the, uh, for the Indian uh, and the Chinese communities, right? So you have the Fucha Methodist Church, which is just behind here. You have the Kampong Kapur Church. Further down the road, you have the uh, Roman Catholic Our Lady of, of Lutz uh, Church and Christ Church near, near the Farrah Park Swimming Pool. So it was, it was uh, from, from the mid-19th century, there has been a co-presence of different ethnic groups and, and religious groups within the area. So I suppose, to, to some extent, to continue to call it Little India is a bit of a misnomer, right? Okay. Uh, now, I, I wanted now to talk a little bit about uh, what I had said right at the begin beginning that interested me, which is this whole question of how religious pluralism is managed, right? And I wanted to look at religions within a, a, a colonial context. Uh, now, we know that, I've already mentioned that religious pluralism defined the uh, straight settlements from the early decades of the 19th century, and you had the presence of non-Christian religions. Um, it may seem counterintuitive, but uh, the, the evidence we have suggests that colonial authorities were mostly content to leave members of these uh, non-Christian communities to manage their own affairs uh, in keeping with the broadly articulated principle of non-interference, right? So, so there was little uh, interference. Of course, this applied specifically to the, to the Malays and to Islam, but the same attitude in principle and in practice was extended to the religions of the Indians and, and the Chinese as well. Uh, the colonial state was focused on managing a diverse population to ensure order and st uh, stability and displayed a lack of interest, even disregard for the sort of private religious lives of, of, of the natives. Um, next, please. Um, so there were few restrictions and controls on, on building of places of worship or their day-to-day -day functioning uh, through the 19th century. In fact, the East India Company in, encouraged, even facilitated the building of, of places of worship by making land grants, uh, partly because they, uh, uh, well, partly because they wanted to maintain order and they also thought that if they appeased the, 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 the uh, uh, workers, then they would be uh, more willing to settle in these places rather than, than, than want to go back. Um, so it's, it's, you know, we have evidence of public performance of festivals uh, and their places of worship, you know, from, from the 19th century. However, uh, I've argued in my work that um, from about the turn of the 20th century, this kind of liberal attitude begins to change, and there is a certain hardening of, of uh, you know, attitudes towards uh, uh, non-Christian native religions, and there's a greater regard, uh, great, greater concern with, with managing and supervising and administering uh, religions. Uh, so, but, but still we can say that the 19th century, the colonial context uh, in the Strait Settlement was not detrimental for expressions of non-Christian religiosity. But I think this liberal stance, uh, you know, begins to change, and uh, despite the absence of restraints and control in this in this uh, arena, uh, the, you know, these did enable expressions of non-Christian religions and facilitated their early institutionalization in in the Strait settlements. Sorry, I have to rush through this. Um, so I wanted to highlight, uh, I'm not going to go through the thing here, this slide here, but I wanted to highlight that from the, the middle of the 19th century, uh, we witnessed a period of inten intense institution building and, and places of worship. So you can look at uh, temples, you can, you can look at uh, uh, the temples that I've listed here, sort of the earliest dated to 1822 onwards and, and continues into, into the 20th century. In fact, of the 24 Hindu temples on the island today, 23 were registered prior to World War II. There was only one temple that was registered after World War II. So, so this is a period of intense uh, institution building and, and activity. Next, please. Um, and then the same thing, you can look at the, the Roman Catholic and the Methodist scene within the Indus, Indian community, the Sikh community, the, 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 the Muslim community, as well as Ramakrishna Mission, etc. So from the middle of the 19th century onwards, we see this period of very intense, uh, you know, period of, of institution building. 
Um, but I will, and this will probably be my, my last slide, so, but I think um, towards the, the turn of the 20th century, there is a shift in thinking, and there is a, a decided shift away from the policy of non-interference, right? And, and we see uh, there's growing, uh, growing political involvement of the colonial authorities in the affairs of the Strait settlements, starting in the closing decades of the 19th century, and other societal spheres are penetrated including the religious, right? Uh, so with this new tone, new institutional structures and mechanisms were formulated and established throughout the British Empire, including in the Strait Settlement. And, and you know, what I've highlighted is the greater regulation and supervision of, of religions uh, in, in the, by the turn of the 20th century. And uh, native religions were administered and managed much more explicitly. Uh, next, please. Um, I just want to highlight the, uh, in this context, one, one piece of legislation and one institution that was uh, explicitly constructed, and this was the Mohammedan, and just two minutes, the Mohammedan and Hindu Endowments Ordinance of 1905, which was designed to administer religious endowments of non-Christian communities in the Strait Settlements. And this also allowed for the formation of a permanent board, the Mohammedan and Hindu Endowments Board, which was set up in 1906, 7, and 11 for Singapore, Penang, and Malacca. Uh, and this law and this institution, and we still have the Hindu Endowments Board with us today, right? So this, this has very deep uh, roots. Uh, and this institutional mechanism and its intent of legitimate regulatory control was in line with the overall rhetoric of civilizing subject populations through rational, objective means. Um, I don't have time, but I just want to say that in conclusion, uh, Singapore has, I think, from the 19th century been a fertile ground for uh, establishing religions and uh, been a very important space and site for encouraging religious innovation and experimentation, etc. But it has also uh, increasingly uh, been subject to a number of, of regulations. Uh, I would argue, in fact, that the colonial context was more facilitating for the expression of religiosity and that the post-colonial context, uh, the post-colonial state has actually been much more interventionist in its uh, desire to manage and regulate and control religion. Um, and I'll you know, just end by saying that despite this sort of desire to regulate and control religion, the desire for religious community and solidarity doesn't seem to have gone away, right? So it's, it's you know, I, I think religious communities always find a way to figure out how to negotiate uh, the, the constraints under which they have to operate. Thank you very much. The, in my, in my reckoning, the presentations were in each respect succinct, clear, illustrated visually, textually, as well as tab with, through tabulations. Um, each of the presenters continued to proceed to define the topic specifically within the larger parameters of what was published. And they have delivered, I think, quite um, provocative data and equally provocative propositions and speculations.